Good morning. Good morning, good morning. I am Lori and this is Dream Big Today Bible Study, yearly Bible study. Good morning, Eileen. Good morning, Sherry. Um, we are on November 13th, 2022. First, I want to remind you um, to put your prayer requests and praise reports in the comments so that we can put them in the prayer journal and so that we can rejoice with you when you have a praise report. Um, good morning, Rita. I um, was reading through, we are in Ezekiel 27, 28 today. And I got to tell y'all, this year reading through Ezekiel, I, um, I, Ezekiel used to be one of my favorite, favorite prophets. Um, well, he probably still is one of my favorite prophets, but I used to love to read Ezekiel. Um, and this year reading through Ezekiel, Ezekiel is uh, a little bit tough. He, um, good morning, Jan, um, because the judgment that God has for them is just so harsh. So it's a little bit tough reading through it this morning. And the scripture in Ezekiel that we're reading this morning is known as the uh, lamentation of, is it going to be tire or tear, or I don't know how to say the name. So please forgive me for that. But it's the lamentation. God is um, having Ezekiel speak to them about uh, their impending judgment that is coming because they are uh, a prideful, a prideful city um, full of themselves, I think is the easiest way to say it. Um, God goes on to uh, tell, describe them as this gorgeous ship um, that is built by the best materials, has the strongest and the best oarsmen that, you know, are rowing for them. And so that's how he is describing them. They are, there were two parts to this city. There was a landlocked portion and then there was the island portion. God is talking about the island portion. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, I can't remember which one it is. Um, had tried to conquer them. Good morning, Montana. Had tried to conquer conquer them, and he could only conquer the landlocked portion of the city. And those that were not destroyed during that time fled to this island of Tyr, um, and that's what God is prophesying now about destroying them because they had, you know, the best of everything. He goes on to tell him in, um, let's see, he's talking to the prince of this city who um, thinks himself wiser than God. Um, his riches have deceived him. His wisdom to get the riches um, has deceived him, and he is all about himself thinks he's better than anybody but so the city as a whole traded in all of the finest of um goods the finest linens the finest wheats and oils and then they had a, a slave trade where they traded humans and Greece, um, I think it was Greece, brought over some slaves from there to trade with them. And Tyr was known um, in the slave trade for being um, cold-hearted and, uh, what was it, cold-hearted and 
guilty, cold hearted and especially guilty in their slave trade. So they didn't treat their slaves um, very well. Nothing like, um, you know, when the U.S. began to do the godforsaken awful trade that we did with slaves and the human trafficking that goes on now, but they were not um, good. And so this island portion of Tyre was fortified by this great wall. And so God is prophesying that it, they're going to be destroyed. Comes to pass, the prophecy is fulfilled when Alexander the Great um, when Alexander the Great goes in and destroys them. It, the um, siege lasts for seven months. And good morning, Lynn. Um, good morning, Tanya. Uh, lasts for seven months. And um, they killed 10,000 people. 30,000 of the inhabitants were sold into slavery. So... And then God, you know, places is telling the prince about his judgment of him and how he behaved because he thought he was so much better than everybody else. The um, history says that the prince that God is speaking about here in, uh, what verse is it? Verse 44, when he's talking about in 28, um, it's not verse 44, y'all. I just can't see. Um, in chapter 28, uh, verse 1, when he starts to prophesy and talk to, tell Ezekiel to prophesy to the prince, um, the prince is thought to have uh, died in when Alexander the Great um, laid siege to the city and destroyed their left it in ruins. Um, apparently, Alexander the Great was extremely annoyed with this prince because during the seven-month siege, um, this prince had no regard for um, the battle that was happening um, and didn't um, treat Alexander the Great with the uh, respect that he thought he deserved. Now, we all know that Alexander the Great was not the greatest person, but um, so in turn, Alexander let his soldiers and everything do as they wished. He let them loose with no restraint to do as they wished, and then um, they were awful, and they destroyed that city. So, but then um, I think it interesting. This is what is interesting to me. Uh, when we get to chapter or when we get to verse 11, God begins to um, discuss or, I mean, he's talking about um, tear still, but what he's discussing, what it is, what it appears to me is it's the fall of Satan. Uh, when Satan, you know, when God created him, he was beautiful and majestic and had all of this rain and was, had jewels all over him. He was radiant. His beauty radiated everywhere. And um, as a result of that, his um, heart was filled with pride because of his beauty. His wisdom became corrupt by his love for splendor because he loved the, the splendidness of everything he could do, of everything that he was. So his heart became corrupt and we all know what happened. Um, he fell down. And so that is kind of what um, God is talking about in Ezekiel today. But then he goes on to say in verse 25, the people of Israel will again live in their own land. 
that I gave my servant Jacob. I will gather them from the distant lands where I scattered them. I will reveal to the nations of the world my holiness among my people. They will live safely in Israel and build homes and plant vineyards. And when I punish the neighboring nations that treated them with contempt, they will know that I am the Lord, their God. So <clears throat> God still says he's going to gather them and bring them back. He always does. He always does what he says he's going to do. So that's just, that was like not anything like super in depth. Um, let's see, is there anything else that I caught? In verse 33, it says, uh, verse 33 of, 20, of chapter 27 of Ezekiel, it says, the merchant, merchandise you trade has satisfied the desires of many nations, the desires of many nations. And I am, I think that maybe those desires were not God's desires that were satisfied. They were just human desires that were satisfied um i think that's all i have for ezekiel today i realize it's more like historic and everything it wasn't like thus say is the lord or anything like that but hopefully you got some insight into it um i am seeing new names on here today and thank you for joining us um then we're in hebrews Hebrews, the faith, faith, we're going to talk about faith. Um, and he goes on and Paul is listing out for the Hebrews that what faith is basically how Abraham walked by faith. And um, when he took his son, Isaac to uh, be sacrificed, he now I've heard I've heard several sermons on this, and we all know, uh, of course, for me personally, I could not imagine. Um, but when God spoke to Abraham this way, history says that um, it was not as jolting or shocking um, as it would be if. God had said to me, to you, um, I want you to take your son that I have promised you uh, many generations would come from, and I want you to go sacrifice him. Now, that was not abnormal to Abraham because in that time and where Abraham came from, sacrifices were normal. This was a normal practice. So, for Abraham, it was, it, it seemed not so completely bizarre uh, like it would for us. So Abraham takes Isaac to sacrifice him. Now it says here um, that Abraham reasoned that God would, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again which I believe, I mean, that's what the word says, but I think that also Abraham's faith was because God had always provided sacrifice before that, um, God would provide a sacrifice. It wouldn't have to be his son. He just walked in, uh, faith. And I find it interesting. I mean, I think it's interesting if we look back over Abraham's journey, um, you know, he, before Isaac was born, his faith was a little wavering um, in that, you know, when he traveled, he would, he would lie to the, the government about who Sarah was. Um, he didn't think God was going to come through. So he had an Ishmael, he and Sarah both. Um, but yet he just kept walking. He just kept moving in the way that um, God wanted him to move. Um, and then here comes Isaac, his pride and joy, you know, his most precious thing. And God says, I want you to take him and sacrifice him. 
I'm not quite sure, faith or no faith, if I would have been so obedient. Um, but, you know, thank God that he was, or we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, so then he goes on and he talks about Jacob um, blessing his family. You know, Joseph had been kidnapped and was um, in Egypt, the second in command in Egypt. And Jacob had so much faith that he, th that the Israelites would leave Egypt that he says, take my bones back um, with you when you leave. So he knew they were going to leave. You know, we all have, I think, um, this is just my opinion. I think that we all have um, a, you know, there's always something in our lives we just have in our knower. Every once in a while, we just get that thing in our knower that people cannot convince us that anything is different. We just know in our knower and we have faith. We believe that. And I think that that, that thing in the knower is what all these people had Jacob and and Moses's parents and Moses and um they all had that thing in their knower where you you just were not going to be moved because if, if we don't have that type of faith then we're we're kind of thrown to and fro um by every circumstance that comes that comes along um and they weren't, they weren't moved. Once they got that thing in their knower, that deep faith in their knower, they weren't moved. Um, and so, um, you know, it talks about Moses's parents were not afraid to, they were not afraid to disobey the, com the king's command. Um, And that strikes me a little bit. And the reason why it strikes me is because I think about right now, the story that is heavy on my heart in the Bible is when Paul and Silas were thrown in jail. Um, Paul and Silas were thrown in jail for being completely obedient to what God was having them do. Complete obedience they were, and they were thrown in jail by nothing that they did. It was by the government and the people that were ruling. And, um, and here we have Moses parents who were not afraid to disobey the King's command. I mean, they just weren't afraid to disobey that. They had that faith in their knower, their knower. Um, and then it goes on to talk about how Moses chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. Um, that's the thing. That's the one comment I wanted to make about Ezekiel today. You know, the city of Tyre was this great city with this mass wealth and all these great goods and all these other nations came to, to get their goods because they were the best. And so all these other nations came to um, get from them and everything was fine until it wasn't the fleeting pleasures of sin everything is good until it isn't um i mean and that's how sin is everything's good until it isn't feels good looks good it's wonderful we're enjoying all this stuff and we're we seem right in our own eyes and it's all good until it isn't, until um, the judgment of, of God comes. But, you know, we, we tend to think in our society today that following Christ means everything will be better. And it is better. So please don't misunderstand me. It is better. But life still happens. There's, we still live in a fallen world. We still live among evil people. There are evil people out there. So, and the way the government's going, it's, I mean, we all know by reading the book that it's going to get worse before it gets better. So Moses fully decided to share in the impression of God's people. 
instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. I mean, there's so much packed in that statement that he's looking for ahead to his great reward can apply to so many things in our lives. Um, arguments with family members, arguments with coworkers. I mean, is it better to um, suffer for the sake of Christ? And by and let me let me clarify here. We tend to think suffering is um, I'm not getting my way. I'm not getting my way. So I'm suffering and I, somebody needs to make this suffering stop. Well, that's a load of crap um, because that's not suffering. Moses suffered by, um, I mean, he was out in the desert. I mean, those people, the Israelites suffered during, when they were in Egypt, they worked tirelessly, tirelessly. Um, to fulfill the demands of a tyrant pharaoh um, and with no grace no mercy at all they worked so hard that's the suffering that moses thought it best to join in and he looked to the prize looking ahead to his great reward there was something in his knower that knew that, that, that God is the great reward, not all of this stuff that I was raised with, not all of these um, comforts, creature comforts that I have. Um, it is better for me to go out there with my people and serve my God and suffer with them than to enjoy these fleeting pleasures. I mean, if we could only get kingdom minded to where we look forward to our reward, the things that happen here that cause us angst or stress or, um, you know, what we think we're suffering um, don't seem so important when we're kingdom minded, when we're seeing the kingdom and looking for our great reward. Our great reward is to be with him, to be with him, the creator of the universe, the lover of our souls. That's our great reward is to be with him. And so if we would be able to focus there, everything else kind of falls away. All of the unimportant things kind of fall away. Um, he kept, let's see, what is it? It is by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. Keep our eyes on the one who is invisible. I mean, Moses was a saint taking the Israelites through the, through the desert. I mean, because they were, I would hate to take a whole group of us through the desert. I mean, I would. It would not be good. It would not be good. Um, so it is by faith that he did all those things. It is by faith, by faith. It is by faith that we live our lives. You know, I think that we, um, I read something this morning about, you know, I can't remember exactly, but the thought that it put in my head is that um, we, I, I'm going to say I, I always say we, but I really mean I, y'all. Um, we take for granted how sovereign, how powerful, how gracious, how merciful, how loving our God is. I mean, we just assume we're going to wake up tomorrow morning. We just assume that, you know, everything's going to be okay that everything's going to go the way it's supposed to um without thinking i don't think it's by faith that we think those things uh necessarily but i think that we 
um, we take for granted how amazing the God we serve is. And we just, you know, he's always there. He's always there, always will be there. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Never going to change. It's a loving God, merciful God, gracious God, sovereign God. And his sovereignty is that he doesn't squash us like a bug. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He can hold back his wrath. So, and yet we take such liberties with our lives that are not our own. Um, we take such liberty. So, anywho kind of a rabbit trail I got off on but then we're in Psalms 111 uh it says everything he does reveals his glory and majesty his righteousness never fails he causes us to remember his wonderful works how gracious and merciful is the is our Lord he gives food to those who fear him he always remembers his covenant he has shown his great power to his people by giving them the lands of their nations. And he does it. And all he does is just and good. And all his commandments are trustworthy. They are forever true to be obeyed faithfully and with integrity. He has paid a full ransom for his people. So even though this is Old Testament, we're hearing about how he's paid a full ransom for his people. His commandments are trustworthy. We can trust everything that he says, regardless of our issues. Um, we can trust everything that he says um, as true, as able to lean on it, as able to stand on it as a firm foundation. I'm going to stand on this. This is what this is who my God is. Um, and then we go on to Proverbs and y'all, the Proverbs that talk about the wife being the, the annoying dripping closet on a rainy day, or it's better to sit on the edge of a roof than listen to a nagging wife every day are funny to me because when I, uh, first started serving God, I was married and, um, I was in a physically abusive relationship. I would like to say that it was of no fault of my own, but I can push some buttons, y'all. Um, so, I mean, there were two sides of that, but um, I would always read these proverbs and I would think, oh my gosh, I am a dripping faucet. I am a nagging wife. That is who I am. Um, and so they're always funny to me. And I always remember them uh, because they made such an impact on me when I was married. And I tried not to be that person, but ultimately I was that person because I didn't really know God very well then. Um, but that is all we have today. I wanna pray for everybody before I hop off here as I always do. Um, so, Father God, I just thank you for your many blessings. I thank you for your grace and your mercy that you have for us and that you show us every minute of every day. God, I thank you that, that you are such a loving, sovereign God. God, that you rule and you reign over our lives. And God, I thank you for that. God, I thank you that you can, um, you reveal to us the full measure of the faith that you have given us, God, that we would be able to walk in the full measure of the faith that you have given us and trust in you in everything that we do. God, that our eyes would be focused on the invisible and what our great reward is, which is you, instead of the circumstances going around. God, that we would be able to look forward to our great reward and be kingdom-minded with every decision that we make. And Father God, I pray blessings upon everyone who would hear the Bible study. I thank you that you place the Bible study before whomever it needs to be placed before. God, that you make a way. 
So Father God, I thank you for what you're doing in all of our lives, what you will do, what you are doing, and what you have done. And we just thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So have a wonderful day with your family. Um, enjoy the, the beautiful sun. It's a little chilly, but uh, enjoy each other and enjoy your community. And thanks so much for joining me today. I appreciate it. Um, and many blessings upon you. Thank you guys.